What if you'd be living in a province that stretches from east to west about as much as the distance between London and Istanbul? And what if that province would barely represent 12% of your entire country? Such a place does exist, and it's called the Autonomous Region of Inner Mongolia. Hi, my name is Sebastian, and you're watching 7 Facts. Aside from what I just told you, this region boasts some other impressive records. Inner Mongolia's 1.2 million square kilometers would make it the 25th largest country in the world. Nevertheless, only 24 million people live here, 5 million of which are Mongol ethnics. That in itself is pretty outstanding because it means that Inner Mongolia actually houses more Mongols than the country of Mongolia itself. The term Inner refers to the descendants of Genghis Khan who retained the title of Khan. They were called Neifan or Inner Tributaries and lived in these parts under the Ming and Qing dynasties. Anyway, Inner Mongolia is definitely not a barren undeveloped region of China. We actually have a lot to talk about, so don't go anywhere just yet. The Mongols are a very famous, albeit no longer as influential of a nation as they used to be. But much of what we know about their history and the history of their ancestral lands comes from Chinese chronicles. Prior to Chinggis Khan, who by 1206 united the Mongol tribes and founded his empire, the control of Inner Mongolia alternated between Chinese peasants and lords in the south and Tungusic, Turkic and Mongol mostly nomadic tribes. Ancient artifacts, however, do show that the primordial ancestors of Proto-Mongols, the so-called slab grave culture, used to inhabit Inner Mongolia, and then some. Now, as you can imagine, those alternations I mentioned meant wars, conquests, losses and retakes between the various Chinese dynasties and the nations of Inner Mongolia. But once the Mongol Empire joined the scene, the Chinese dynasties like the Western Xia or the Qin fell one after the other. They were replaced by the Mongols. In fact, Kublai Khan, the grandson of Chinggis, established a whole new Chinese dynasty, the Yuan. Kublai actually had his summer capital at Shangdu in Inner Mongolia, which ethnically was still dominated by Mongol and Turkic tribes, not Chinese. It was the Ming Dynasty, an ethnically Han Chinese family that overthrew Mongol rulership in 1368. They were the ones who rebuilt the Great Wall of China at its present location. In Inner Mongolia, the wall roughly follows the southern borders of the region, which shows just how volatile this area was even after the fall of the Mongols. And this land would also become a core region of Mongolia in 1449. That year, there was a border conflict between the Ming and the Northern Yuan, a remnant of the Mongol state, a conflict that led to the capture of the Chinese emperor and the invasion of Inner Mongolia by Mongol tribes. That transformed the place into the political and cultural center of all Mongols for nearly two centuries. But again, nothing lasts forever, and the Manchus under the Qing family rose to a position of great power and influence. They gained far-reaching control of Inner Mongolia's tribes by 1635 and less than a decade later invaded Ming China and became the new rulers of the country. The Inner Mongol descendants of Chinggis Khan tried to fight back but were defeated. And because of their opposition, they were killed, their titles were abolished, all royal males were executed and all royal females were sold into slavery. Yep. Pretty nasty stuff. Anyway, little by little, Han Chinese farmers began to move in, legally and illegally, while Mongols were forbidden to travel outside their banners to keep them divided, of course. In 1911, the Qing fell and became the last imperial family of China. Outer Mongolia gained independence, but internal strifes and rebellions in Inner Mongolia prevented a full reunification. The new Republic of China, though, promised a new nation of five races, including Mongol, and so all rebellions were put down and Inner Mongolia remained a part of China. In 1937, parts of Inner Mongolia became a puppet state of the Japanese. Mengjiang was established by a Mongolian prince and immediately became a subordinate of Japan. 
It was dissolved by the Soviet and Mongol armies and was reincorporated into China in 1945, where it remains to this day. A city of 3.5 million would probably be a top tier city in Europe, definitely known throughout the continent, right? That's not the case with Chinese cities though. Hohot, the capital of Inner Mongolia, is a prime example of that. Its name in Mongolian means Blue City, which is a pretty big deal since in Mongol culture, blue is strongly associated with purity, divinity and the sky. It became the Blue City in 1557, when the Mongol leader Altan Khan built the Dajao Temple here. The same city was also the capital of the lesser known puppet state of Japan, Mingjiang, in 1939. Today, despite being dominated by Han Chinese ethnics, other sizable minorities are still present and that gives Hohot a wealth of ethnic elements. Islamic, Mongol, Hu and Manchu architecture, traditions and cuisine are intermingled with the characteristics of the Han. The city also boasts an impressive number of Buddhist temples and towers from the Ming and Qing era, plus mansions, parks, museums, shopping areas and so on. So, as you can see, despite being almost invisible on tourist radars, Hohot is actually a surprisingly interesting place to discover. Since we've mentioned Mongolia so many times, of course we can't not say anything about the famous and infamous Genghis Khan. And what might we find in Inner Mongolia that's tied to the Great Khan? Why, his mausoleum of course. The mausoleum of Chinggis Khan, better known as the Lord's Enclosure, is the main center of worship of this ancient conqueror of the world. It is where he is still revered as an ancestor, dynastic founder and deity. The cult of Chinggis Khan, shared between Mongols and Chinese alike, is a form of Mongolian shamanism, in which he is considered not just a cultural hero, but also a divine ancestor, an aspect or embodiment of Tenger the all-encompassing god of heaven in Tengrist religions. Before you get all excited, the mausoleum is actually a cenotaph, meaning it's an empty tomb erected to honor the deceased person. And that's because nobody knows where Chinggis Khan was actually buried. His instructions were to be buried secretly and without markings. During the Cultural Revolution, the mausoleum was desecrated and most of its relics destroyed, but since the 1980s it was reopened. If you plan to visit this place, be mindful of the fact that here, Chinggis Khan is an incontestable national hero. Saying otherwise might get you deported, as 20 tourists found out in 2015, after they watched a BBC documentary about the conqueror in their hotel rooms and were then arrested because they were, quote unquote, watching and spreading violent terrorist videos. Ever since 1958, Inner Mongolia has been a part of humanity's strive to explore the harsh environment of space. Zhukuan Satellite Launch Center in Inner Mongolia was China's first ever space launch facility and it's been continuously in operation ever since, thus making it the space center with the most Chinese launches of all kind. To this, we can add the fact that Zhukuan is still China's only launch site for manned space missions, namely the Shenzhou program. While the launch center can be visited by tourists, this place is a military facility, so access is very restricted and you can only visit through planned visits and guided tours. This is one of humanity's space sports though, so a visit might just be worth the effort. Inner Mongolia is not a province of China, legally speaking that is. This part of the country is classified as an autonomous region. While the local government roughly follows the same structure as that of a province, there are some differences. For instance, the chairman has to belong to an ethnic minority group who in turn is kept in check by the communist party secretary, who in turn has to come from another region. An autonomous region has limited autonomy in both political and economic aspects, which actually led to Inner Mongolia creating its own economic roadmap. In all, this is an administrative form inherited from the Soviets, created to formulate a high level of self-governance in regions with large minority ethnic groups. Of course, that all sounds nice and is generally a good thing, but take this info with a grain of salt. 
Unlike in the Republic of Mongolia, where the Mongolian language is written using the Cyrillic alphabet, in Inner Mongolia the switch was never made. Here, the traditional Mongol script is still being used. Classical Mongolian is what we call a true alphabet, where consonants and vowels have their own separate letters. What is different about it, at least when compared to the more widespread alphabets of the world, is that these letters are written in vertical lines, not horizontal. Hudum Mongol Bichig, as it's called, is an adaptation of the old Uyghur alphabet, although it borrows some features like cursivity and the dot system from Arabic. The Uyghurs, however, adapted their script from Sogdian, an Aramaic script at its origin, but rotated the orientation. The reason why they did that is because the Uyghurs wanted to emulate the writing systems of the Chinese empires. In case you didn't know, many East Asian scripts can traditionally be written vertically, not just horizontally. Within the country of Mongolia, the authorities replaced classical Mongolian with Kyrillic in 1946 and today very few people there understand the old alphabet. In Inner Mongolia, though, Hudum Mongol Bichig remained in use and is still the alphabet for about 6 million people. And that was all for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed that. Don't forget to like and subscribe before you leave. Leave your comments downstairs and if you wish to do so, you can help out this channel through my Patreon page. I do hope to see you next time. Bye.